Hello, my name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. I'm writing an article for Redgate. Shocking, I know. Um, who knew that I would write articles for Redgate? Now, I'm writing an article for Redgate, and I'm writing it on um, our, one of our tools, SQL Monitor. This is not a sales pitch on SQL Monitor, though. I don't want you guys to get excited about that or, or upset about that. Um, this is a talk about testing. And what I want to show you is, is how I'm setting up a test environment within Azure. Um, I'm using Azure only to set up a full-blown test environment, um, virtual machine, a series of Azure SQL databases, uh, a database pool, and all of this stuff. And um, I figured that sharing how I'm setting this up, how I'm doing my testing, and some of the mechanisms I'm using to to put a load on a system um, might be interesting to see you know what it is and how it is that I've done these things so that um, you guys could replicate it yourself if you ever wanted to in the future um, that's it we're gonna get going on that um, please hit the like hit the subscribe this is useful stuff for you I really you know would appreciate it if you would uh, hit the like and hit the subscribe let's go take a look at the tech obviously this is the Azure portal and while you want to do most of your management in a production environment of the Azure through PowerShell as much as you can, um, in terms of demos and for test beds and, and simple setups where you're not doing you know lots and lots of things in, in a, you know in a repeated fashion, um, you can just kind of go into the portal and set things up. Now here's the most important thing. I'm going to start off with resource groups, and this is really vital um, for especially for a testing this is very vital and for the resource groups I've got you know currently three different resource groups I've got one where I'm learning Postgres and then I've got the one that I'm working on here for performance monitoring now the reason I'm pointing this out is, is because when you determine that you've you've done your testing and you want to clean things up um, generally you don't want to just leave stuff running you want to get rid of it and the easiest way to get rid of stuff is simply to put it all into a resource group and then drop the resource group. Drop in the resource group drops all the resources. That's it. Nice and simple. No no tricks. No no muss. No fuss. So it, it's just the one thing I would emphasize that if you set don't let just this thing create multiple resource groups for multiple resources for a single test bed. If you're setting up multiple test beds, I would set up multiple uh, resource groups. But for a single test. I would set up one resource group and that way you've got one place to go to clean everything up. And by everything, I mean the things inside the resource group. Now, when we see this, this will come up and you'll see that I've got multiple stuff inside of here. What I've done is, is I've created an environment that is simulating um, a, an actual estate. And so what I've got is I've got a pool I've set up, monitor pool, and that's my server. Um, and that's that's a pool of databases using using the database pool and you can see that there's pool database one pool database two and pool database three um, I've defined the elastic pool itself um, I do have a, the cloud service set up for perf performance monitor I've got a storage account and a virtual account and the storage account you'll notice it's got a funny name I let the default pick it for the storage account for this test mainly just to, to illustrate what you're going to see if you don't control things directly. So it took the virtual machine that I was setting up and used that virtual machine as you know the basis for a, a name and then threw a number on it to, to make sure that it was unique. Uh, I would not recommend this for anything that you do. Letting the defaults come out like this is, is just as bad as letting the defaults come out in, in index names or you know, constraint names or anything else, it's going to lead to confusion and make things hard to understand. So make sure you break things apart. I've got a, um, uh, um, a virtual network, and then I've got a couple of databases. I've got um, two that are shared. So they're on a, a shared server. There, here's the shared performance server. And then I've also set up a standalone server. And so um, that standalone server has a standalone database. And so this represents an environment. So what we've got here is just a series of environments. Now all of these are, are in a single um, location. They're all in one data center. 
I can set up, you know, if I want to simulate, you know, multiple data centers, I can do that. If I want to simulate, you know, geo-replication, I can definitely do that. You just have to be a little prepared to pay for all that stuff. Um, speaking of which, let's just drill down on one of the databases. Now, each database I set up, I set them all up just slightly differently. Some of them are monitoring core. Some, uh, some of them are monitoring DTU. And um, it's just a question of... of determining what it is I want to test and so um, this one it looks like is um, using DTU so it, it's not looking at core this one's looking at DTU um, obviously there's no load yet because I've not set that part up yet that's going to be part two of this video you'll see it here in just a second um, but basically that's the setup now what I'm going to do is let's go back And this is my server. Now this server is going to use SQL Monitor to monitor the other databases. But that's not the, that's not the, the, the point of this video. The point of this video is what else I'm going to do in this server. So what we need to do is we're going to connect up to the server and take a look at the PowerShell script that I'm running and how I'm running that. So here I've logged into the virtual machine that I created up on Azure. And this is where I'm going to be doing a lot of the work to generate the load on all of the other things that I'm accessing. So what I've done is really simple. I've created a store procedure. And this is the store procedure, create or alter sales order info um, by sales, uh, sales info by sales order ID. And I'm just going to pass in sales order ID and retrieve some information. It's a very simple, straightforward store procedure. Using the databases, um, I mean, all every one of these, if we look over here, is a sample database. Um, so they're all the same database, but I can put you know varying loads on them. Um, they are all the same um, example database that comes with Azure. So it makes it really easy for you guys to you know quickly slap together a database and, and put things to work. Now, how am I calling this? So I have a PowerShell script running and. It's making a connection to my database, and you guys can, you know, here's my password. You guys are, feel free to use it. Um, no, you won't be able to get in because I haven't set up the firewall to allow you in. But regardless, this is running. It's connecting up to the database pool DB1. Um, it's not a trusted connection. It's using the SQL login, and it's pulling together all the sales order IDs with this command, and then it's setting up to execute a store procedure, the store procedure that we just defined, and optionally occasionally I'm clearing the cache and because this is Azure SQL database I'm using the alter database scope configuration to clear the cache way the way this works is is it runs forever because while one is not equal to zero keep running for each row in the reference data um, run through this data and so what it's what it will do is it will run through all the data in the reference data which is all of the sales order IDs and it will run these queries and then it will reset and run them again and, and run them again over and over again until I stop it. So this is one way to generate load. Now also what it's doing is it's counting executions and as it counts the executions if they um, fall between these numbers it will do a weight check based on the modulus and if the modulus is equal to zero then it will wait for a period of time before it starts running again so that you get a varied set of executions so it's not just a stream of queries that goes up and down. Then it executes the store procedure and then it occasionally will clear out the cache causing recompile events and other stuff and all of these are just different ways that you can do testing. None of this is something that's carved in stone you have to do it this way but this is just one mechanism of how it's done. Now, what would I do? I'm going to open up a new PowerShell window for each of my databases and then have these running all at once. So one server is going to generate load for all of the other machines. Um, they're not returning data, so it's, you know, it's, it, you know, execute non-query, execute non-query. So nothing's coming back, so all these things have to do is manage this calls. They don't have to manage the retrieval. Um, which makes this thing generate nothing but load. And so that's the whole point of this is between the um, setup of the um, databases 
and then the ability to generate load on those databases, I've got a full-blown test bed with load that will then behave like it was, you know, uh, an actual SQL Server instance being, you know, um, used. And finally, if we take a look, we can actually see in the last hour, I have now have load running on the system where before there was nothing because it was just a, a blank data, you know, uh, an empty database with no connection. Now I've got transactions occurring and things are occurring within the database and, and this is what I'm going to use as my test bed for all of the other work I'm doing for this um, article. Now don't go away, we're not done. Hit that like, hit that subscribe. This is just one example. There's a lot of ways you can get this done. I could, instead of using the PowerShell script, I could set up distributed replay. Distributed replay is, is persnickety. Um, I like it. I do like it. I do use it, um, especially if I've got a real production environment and I can capture a real production load and then do a, a, per, a replay of that production load. Uh, distributed replay is a fantastic tool. Unfortunately, when we're just in a complete test bed situation, I find that distributed replay is um, just too much work to set up. Um, and, and if I don't have a, a real load that I have to, you know, I have to build and generate the load in order to capture the load, in order to replay the load. Um, distributed replay is just too painful. Um, it, it's so much easier for me to build a load in PowerShell as, I, as I've done here. You know, it's obviously simple load, but a, a distributed load that, that you can run in multiple places and, and get things done. So that's how I'm getting it done through through there. Um, and that works in Azure, it works in locally, it works on VMs. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how I do it because I, it's just a PowerShell script running queries and so I can generate load. And that's, and that's the key here is to generate load. Now in terms of what I'm monitoring and how I'm monitoring it, we're not going to get into that here. Um, that's why I've got the article for. So um, please, you know, once, once we publish, I'll update the description down below so you guys can see the article. Um, it, it's going to be a little while. Uh, you're going to see the video way before I get the article done. But um, that gives you a good overview, gives you a good idea of what's going on, and um, that's it. My name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software.